So hi everyone. This will be rather technical stuff. No Lego here, so please fasten your seat belts. Let me start with a short recap of how we wrote asynchronous code in JavaScript in the past and how we do it today. So historically, at the beginning, there were callbacks. And you probably all know this pattern. It's really standard stuff. <laughs> so here we call some function. We give it some argument. And typically, the last argument is so-called callback function. Now this function fetch data can take some time to actually compute the, the response to us. And after this time, it may be a while, it may be a longer time, then the callback is called with the corresponding data or error if there was some problem during the computation. So this was the very first thing that, that was introduced in JavaScript. And it's extremely simple. I mean, conceptually simple. But writing code with callbacks is actually not so simple. This is some taste of, of how the code with callbacks may look like. It's not very nice. First, it's really hard to execute one thing after another after, after another. And it's even more complicated to, to do error handling properly. So this was land where the term callback hell originated from. And since it was no good, then Promises came. And Promises was really great, and the whole code looked much nicer with Promises. This is the same code you saw before functionally. But still, it's not ideal. There is a lot of syntactic clutter here. Oops, oops sorry. Uh, we have this dense everywhere, a lot of parentheses, a lot of lambda functions everywhere. So finally, async await came. You can see async await as some kind of syntactic sugar on promises. And this makes the code look really nice. This is the same code you see before and before before. And if you don't know what async await exactly does, you don't have to bother with this at this moment. We'll get to it in a few minutes. But for now, just notice that the code is significantly shorter. It's much more fun to write and read. So yeah, you might think that we found the holy grail, right? This is it. Code looks, per code looks perfect. So quest over. But actually, not everyone likes promises. These are some projects from JavaScript world. Those are not like end user projects, but libraries which allows end user to write asynchronous code. And none of these uses promises. Usually they use generators with some home built stuff. It's not just this. Rich Hickey, when he introduced CSP core async in, into Clojure, he said roughly that async await is a really nice sugar, but we should put it on a better cake, by which he means promises. So yeah, so what's so wrong about promises and async await and why people build another stuff if we already have something in the standard and so on. So what you will see today, I introduce YAKOL to you. YAKOL is yet an another coroutine library which I wrote and it's library for doing asynchronous stuff. And I will show it to you how YAKOL works and simultaneously I will illustrate what's the problem with promises. So what, what you cannot do with promises or you cannot do it nicely. So let me start with some very simple async await code. OK, here I create function invoice pay. And finally, in do business, I call all these functions here. So let's have a look what invoice does. In the first line here, it awaits some promise. What does it mean to await the promise? This means I want to stop the execution here at this line and wait until the promise is fulfilled, which in this case happens after approximately 100 milliseconds. Now, when this promise fulfills, I can gather the return value from the promise like this. But it's of no use here because I'm just awaiting delay, so yeah, I'll delete it. But this syntax would work. And after 100 milliseconds, the code 
the execution is resumed and it runs until next await is found. In this case, there is no next await, the whole function ends, and this means that undefined is returned as a return value. It's important to note that just the fact that the execution is paused here, it doesn't affect the whole node's even loop. The machinery is still running, the even loop is not freezed. So for example, if in case of a web server, then we can have one execution which is paused here, but still the web server is, is responsive and it can handle other requests. And it can even do another chunks of works by processing the current request. It's just this execution which is paused here. And finally, since we awaited some promise here, we don't know when this function will end. It can be immediately or it can be in a few whiles. So it doesn't make sense for this function invoice to return standard JavaScript value. Since we are awaiting something, the return will, will happen sometime in the past, and therefore we have to return promise. And that's exactly what this async is telling us. Async function is just a synonymical for function returning promise. So that's pretty much it about async await you have to know. If you like promises, but you don't know the syntax, you definitely should start using it. It's, it's really a step forward. And of course, it's not supported now by almost nobody, but Babel can transpile it, so no problem with it. OK, so that's the function invoice. Pay is doing roughly the same stuff. Finally, do business just awaits first invoice and then pay, which means first all the stuff from invoicing is, is done, and then when this is finished, all the stuff from pay is done. OK, so that's about it. Let me run this for you. OK, no surprises here. Now, let me show you how would the same code look like with Yakol. So we have to do first few, few tweaks here. So first, I have to replace async function with function generator, with, with generator function, which is this strange function star, literal. OK, so we have generator functions everywhere. Now, instead of awaiting promise, I have to yield promise. Yield is a special keyword which you can use inside generator functions. So this is the second rule. Instead of await, I will yield everything. And the third rule, when I'm yielding a generator, I have to run the generator first. So I run invoice, I run pay, and then finally I run the whole stuff. OK, and let's see if I get it right. Oh, I'm still awaiting. So yield. And I have to import run from somewhere. And it's running. OK, so this does the same stuff as the code with async await before. We just do some substitutions and we have to run everything. So what's the point of using it, right? If I just have to write more to have the same result. Let me show you another example. I modified it a little bit. I throw away all delays because I don't need it now. Function pay throws an error. Now. Next thing, I deliberately forgot to put await here in do business function. So I just call the pay, but I'm not awaiting the result. And finally, the whole do business is encapsulated in a try catch block. So I'm trying to catch the error. Now, what do you think will happen when I run this? What I will see on my screen? I will give you a few more vials of awkward silence to think about this. OK, everyone ready with their guesses? OK, so let's see. What do we have? That's it. I hope at least some people are surprised by now. Like, come on, where is my error, right? I throw an error, I catch it, it, it should be somewhere. But it's not. The error is completely silent. And yeah, the problem is I forgot to put the await here. 
by not awaiting the promise, I created so-called dangling promise. And dangling promise is a really dangerous thing because no one really cares when dangling promise ends and what errors it may produce. It's just, it's just there. It lives in the matrix. So, yeah, this is a, this is a problem. Imagine pay was doing some important stuff, not just from error, but doing some, I don't know, some payments, for example. And imagine what will happen if this pay will fail in one execution out of 1,000. The error will be nowhere. Your code will just, from time to time, fail. It will give you hell to debug this. Now, let me show you the similar code with Yakol. So, I have generator functions here and here, throw, yield, run, invoice, but I forgot to yield from pay. And here is how I catch errors in Yakol. So, you have to attach, attach error handlers like this. And when I run it, yes, I can catch the error. This is much more decent behavior than promises give us. And back to the promise code, you can say that it's my problem that I forgot to put await here, but it's not so easy to get awaits right, because A, we are in JavaScript, we don't have types, we don't know exactly what to await and what not, so it's easy to forget await somewhere. And even if you use some type system, then still, B, sometimes it's completely valid just to construct the promise, assign it to some variable, and then await it on some other place. This is completely fine. This is how you run things in parallel with async await. So you have to do this from, from time to time. So it's far from easy to get all the awaits right. Now, about the Yakul example. How does this work exactly? What's the semantics of it? So the whole Yakul is organized on the concept of coroutines. You can imagine coroutine as some kind of process. It's not a real OS process, but you can think about it this way. The coroutine is created when I call run something. So in this case, I run invoice, run pay, and run do business. We have three coroutines here. And those coroutines are organized in parent-child relationship. When the coroutine is born, it immediately identifies who is its parent and make a relationship with it. So in this case, invoice and pay know that do business is their parent. And the rule number one of Yakol is that the parent always take care of unhandled errors of their children. So in this case, if pay produces an error and doesn't handle it by self, the error is propagated to do business coroutine and it's do business work, it's do business business to actually catch the error and handle it somehow. So yeah, this is not num rule number one from Yaku library. It works here, it works in more complicated cases. Here on the left, I added some more so-called logic. So I have some blacklist check, which I check, which I, which I call here in A. And it's the same story. If transfer coroutine produces an error, its next parent is, is, is pay. And if pay does not handle oops, this error, the error is propagated to the grandparent to do business coroutine. So that is about it. Now, rule number two of Yako is that the parent coroutine cannot end until all its children have ended. It makes sense because the parent has to take care of unhandled errors, so it cannot end prematurely. Let me illustrate this for you on two other examples. So first, async await example. In this case, I modify pay. Now it does not throw an error, but it takes a really long time to complete. It takes five seconds to, to complete. And finally, main function just, just logs when it thinks it, the, the whole business started and ended. And yeah, just, just as before, I, I forgot to put await here. So I, I'm creating 
dangling promise. And what do we got? OK, so business ends, or at least we think so. But the dangling process is still running there, doing some side effects. But we don't know about it, yeah? We, we think the business ends almost instantly. It's just some dangling promise out there which still is doing its job. The same snippet, but with coroutines. Once again, long-running promise, forgotten yield, and main just as before. I run this. And you can see it politely ends all its children, only now the business has ended, when all its spawned coroutines have ended. So this is it. And what we did until now, we basically saw two, two pains which you can have with, with standard promises. It's dangling promise problem. And just to illustrate to you how great this is, let me show you some more real-world example. Express is really popular Node.js web framework. And with a little extra boilerplate, which you can find in Yakov's Express helpers part, you can use coroutines as Express request handlers. So in this case, I wrote a very simple middleware. You can notice it's, it's a coroutine, so yeah, that, that's cool. What this request handler does, this middleware does, is that first it opens transaction, I mean database transaction by this. I remember it. Then I yield next. By yielding next, I'm saying, whoever wants to deal with this request next, please now take your time. All the other middlewares and, and the request handlers, now it's your time, do your job. And finally, when all these guys finish, it's I'm in charge one more time, and I have something to say, and I will commit the transaction. So this is like version one of transaction middleware, but we can do better. This is similar stuff, but I'm running this in run catch block, and if any error happens during the execution, I will explicitly roll back the transaction rather than let it time out eventually sometime. Now, let me stress one more time how great this is. We commit the transaction, but only after all spawned coroutines, yielded from or not, have completed. So there is for sure no dangling work in progress. And also, if any coroutines spawned during this process, yielded from or not, produced any error, transaction is for sure rollbacked. So that's cool. And finally, this explicit parent-child relationship between coroutines gives us a possibility to build another amazing stuff on that. So let me tell you about this. First, we have context. Context is something like zones in Dart, if you know it by the chance. I, I copied the, the thing from that. So let me explain what it, do, what, what it does. Each coroutine is associated with a context map, that simple ES6 map object. And the coroutine can write to the context and read from it. The cool thing is that if the value, which I'm trying to read, is not found in current coroutine context, the read is escalated to the parent, grandparent, and so on. So for example, if this guy says that hello, hello equals world in its context, and this guy tries to get hello, it gets world. This is how context works. How can you put this to use? Let me revise my express middleware one more time. Not this one. This shitty, but the second one. Here, after I create a transaction, it will be probably a good idea to put it to context. Oops. Like this. 
By putting it to context, I make it accessible for anyone who is interested in handling of the current request. And it does not conflict with, with other transactions opened in other contexts of, of other requests. And when I do this, I can write simple helper function, get transaction, and all this has to do is get the transaction from the context and return it. Now, anyone calls this function, it will get the, the current open transaction which it needs to have. Yeah. So that's about context. Then we have a messaging system similar to what CSP has. But uh, I use CSP for some time and I notice I don't like every piece of the library or what I don't like most, I don't use it. I don't need it. So I implement the only small subset of CSP I really use and like. So you can create some channels. You can push messages to channels. These pushes are always non-blocking. And then you can yield messages from channels, and this yield can be blocking. And yeah, this is a great, great mechanism for, synchronizes, for, for synchronizing multiple coroutines. It's, it's really handy, and thanks to whoever created CSP context. And finally, Holy Echo plays very nice with promises. So one more demonstration. Uh, this is how I write to my database. Next is very simple query builder. And next returns, when, when I insert something to the database, it returns some promise-like object. So I can simply yield it, and it will play nice with my coroutine. And it's not only this, but it works also another way around. So the whole coroutine is promise-like object. So for example, when mocha test return the function I put to mocha test, when it returns some coroutine, Mocha can understand that it has to wait until all the stuff is done. And once again, in this test, it completes only after all coroutines which I created, yielded from or not, have ended. And you know, if any of these coroutines produced any error, the test will be marked as fail. So it's really easy to use this. And finally, there are a few features I would like to implement in the next future, especially if you guys will like this. Uh, there is this concept of termination. What does it mean? Imagine you created some long-running process, it promises, and sometimes, suddenly you realize you are not interested in the answer anymore. Yeah, you do some, some computations and suddenly, for example, some timeout is reached. So, okay, I don't need this result. I have to do some, some other stuff. So what you can do with promises in, the, in such a case? And the answer is not very much. Of course, you can fulfill or reject the main promise you are waiting for. But what about, what about these guys here? They are still running, eating your CPU and doing some side effects you might not be interested in anymore. And that's not good. Once again with Yakul, thanks to explicit parent-child relationship with, with, between coroutines, we can easily terminate all the coroutine tree instantly. So it's much more cleaner than some monkey patched termination of promises. So that's about it. There are a few other many a few other features I would like to implement. I think they are really cool, but I don't want to overwhelm you today. So, but, but I will be really excited to chat about this thing later. I would be really glad if you give me some constructive feedback. Uh, you can find the whole yeah, call here on GitHub, or you can log me on NPM. The whole thing is in alpha stage. We are using it on some projects, but I don't know. Probably I wouldn't use it in production on some more bigger project now. So, so you, you use this with care, but hopefully we'll get to the point soon when the whole thing will be, will be stable and the API won't change and all that stuff. Finally, this is meant mostly for server usage. You can use it in client as well. 
I'm not sure if the edit value on, on client is it, so big. But if you use, uh, if you use asynchronous stuff a lot on, on clients, and if you find in your code long promise chains, then probably this is also a good, good fit for you. OK, that's about it. Thank you for your attention and questions. Okay, are you not just trading, don't forget away with don't forget run? Absolutely not. The key difference is if you forget to run thing, it, does, it doesn't do anything. You just, it, it, it's the same thing as if I write, let me see, okay, if, if I write console log, yeah, it also doesn't do anything because I didn't execute the function. And I probably discover really, really quickly, ah, Okay, it's not there. <laughs> okay, I mean, if you, if you type console.log and semicolon and, and no parentheses, you don't call the function, you are not doing anything, and you will discover pretty quickly that you are not doing anything. The problem with forgetting await is that the, the promise is still doing the work. And irritatingly, often it happens that you, you won't discover the problem because the work will complete, will finish, until you need it to be finished. On the contrary, where you forget to run something, it'll do nothing. It'll be just like if you just type some function without executing it. So, so, so definitely not. You will debug this much more quicker. What? Number of likes. Cool. What happened there? On oh, fire. Okay. Uh, okay. What's the difference between yield and await? There are just two different keywords. Await is used for async await stuff, and yield is more general concept use with generators. But actually, I think that uh, async await is implemented using also the generator stuff. So I think that await uses await uses uh, yield on, on the background, or at least in some Babel transpiling, you will, you will find it. It's, it's so. Uh, async await are not syntax for sugar for promises, but rather for run generator utility. Yes, yes, it, it, it's true. It, it's how you look at it. You can look at it as a complete brand new stuff or, or syntax sugar to promises. Uh, I just say it's, it's syntax sugar for promises because the behavior, behavior you get from async await is really similar to what you get from promises. If you rewrote all my examples with async await to, to the promise land, standard promise land. All the failures I was illustrating would be the same. So there is no, no significant difference be between these. It's just with the async await, the code looks nicer. That's why I, why I say it's some syntactic sugar. But yeah, you are right. There is some more fundamental stuff in the background. Uh, don't you think casing away is too imperative approach? Also, what about try catch hell? Yes, async away definitely is imperative approach, and I think it's good in some cases. I don't think everything has to be 100% functional all the time. I, I don't mean, don't get me wrong, I really like, love the functional programming, but there is limits when it should be used and, and when not. So uh, once again, what did you forget run? I already said this, but once again, the most important thing, if you forget run, nothing will happen. If you forget to run pay, none of your payments will be executed. Yeah? So you'll debug this quite quickly. If you forget to run pay, 
no payments will, will happen at all. On the contrary, if you forgot to await pay, then 99 pays out of 100 can complete properly on time and without any errors. And the, the, the 1% which does not will give you hell. Believe me, been there. Uh, what's the difference between this and Co? Yeah, Co is another cool code coding library, uh, but I think Co basically follows on, on writing asynchronous stuff with, with coroutines, but without this cool parent-child relationship stuff. So for example, you, you can never, in, in Co, I don't think you will be ever able to terminate coroutine with all its children, as you can do it now. I think Co was especially cool in old times when there was no async await because it, allow, it allows you to, to write nice code with those tools you have at the time. Generators put off a lot of developers. Do you think they add to the table is a little bit a learning curve? Well, I don't know. I think this is pretty subjective thing. Uh, promises are extremely hard to, to understand for, for standard people who you just hire or for people who are new to programming. So the yeah, promises are hard. Now, if you don't want to use raw promises, you have to use either async await or generators and yield. And this is just, I'm, I'm just swapping the keywords here. So I don't think that what the Yakuls brings is some, some kind of extra not understandable boilerplate. If you don't go with Yakul, you will probably go with with async await, which is just as complex as this and has those dangling issues I demonstrated to you. Is it possible to visualize the data flow? Yes, exactly. This is something I want to work on. If you noticed, one of my well, one of items on my to-do list is to give you better stack traces and better debugging info. With this explicit parent-child coroutine system, you can have a really, really powerful insight into what's happening in your code because you exactly know who called what coroutine and with what arguments it was spawned. So when something is, is broken, you can, you can have much more information about it than, than just, just plain stack trace. And yeah, I'm thinking about many things here. Maybe I will do some browser, in-browser debugging tool for this. We'll see. But yeah, it's not there now, but definitely it's on my to-do list. Uh, why not observables instead of promises? This is a rather broad question. What kind of observables? Yeah, you can use Rx, and that's completely different land. Rx is it, it's a broad topic. So yeah, if you like that style of programming, doing attaching callbacks and, and listening to streams and, and so on, for sure, that, that's a one way how you can do this. This is more about doing a code which feels like standard Java or, or Python code. That do this, do this, wait this, then wait for this, then wait for this, and then, then continue with, with this stuff. I think, for example, that attaching listeners on, on streams is, is conceptually hard thing. It's easy when you are looking at some hello world example, but when you go into more stream hell, it's, it's far more complicated to, to, to mentally grasp all the complexity in there. Uh, yeah, try run catch error. No, 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 I don't understand this. But definitely, you, you cannot do the, the proposed syntax. And yeah, I, I, I would really like if you can use standard try catch block with, with this and not this awkward dot catch something. But I don't think there is a nice way how to do this. If you some someone 
create some some system. How, but but yeah, w w without transpiling the code with, with some Babel plugin, of course. With Babel plugin, everything is possible. But this is for now just a library. It does not force you to transpile your code in any way before running, apart for, from standard stuff. And I think this try catch would need some reprocessing, which I would like to avoid. Uh, All right, I, I think that's all the that's time it. we have. Oh, okay. So okay. let's uh, get a round of applause. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thomas.